All right. Uh, thanks, Glenn, uh, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, Gerald Knizek for these shirts. And um, without much ado, we'd move on to the introduction. Um, as you know, hi, I'm Punya. And I'm Matt. And we both want to speak. <laughs> so we decided to flip a coin to see who would be able to talk today. And I won. <laughs> Um, but I still want my voice to be heard. So we stole an idea. From one of our favorite intellectuals, Stephen Colbert. So he has an approach called The Word, where he has a speech. He's accompanied by text alongside of him. And this text is in somewhat of a different voice, sometimes agreeable and sometimes disagreeable. And using this technique in our talk, you are going to get two, two for, for the, the price, price of one. <laughs> So this is my space. And this is my space. Um, and so for the most of the presentation, Punya will be speaking, and I'm going to be texting on the left. So you'll be hearing me, but in a different way. All right. Ready to start? That's the end of the intro. So we begin. Thank you, Matt, for that little text message there. It's early in the morning, it's 8 a.m., and neither of us is a very, you know, morning person. So we appreciate um, that you guys showed up, and we thought that there's, you know, a little bit of a pressure on us to be a little exciting, <clears throat> if not for you guys, at least to wake us up. And so one thing we thought maybe we could do a song, um, but I can't sing. That turns out Matt can't either, okay. Uh, but we can borrow ideas. Um, so we appropriated an idea from Larry Lessig. Um, no, we appropriated an idea from Larry Lessig, and we came up with a refrain. And the refrain is in three parts. Okay? So here we go. Start refrain. One, teaching with technology is a wicked problem. Wicked problems require creative solutions, and teachers are designers of the total package. End refrain. All right, let's do this again. <clears throat> the refrain, teaching with technology is a wicked problem. Wicked problems require creative solutions, and teachers are designers of the total package. So that's our refrain, and we'll be coming back with it over and over. Okay, all right, fine, move on. Number one, teaching with technology is a wicked problem. Let's start with what we call pedagogy. Now, these are rules, theories, ideas of teaching, whatever you call it, okay, teaching. Um, but there's one thing we can be sure of, that pedagogy is messy. Messy and complicated, it's not as straightforward as it looks. Well, without even getting into theories and stuff, just think about the various roles teachers play. For instance, you want teachers to be wise and assistive and thoughtful, funny, um, dramatic, flexible, creative, humble, fair, you know, all these, this is a pretty amazing list. So we can agree that teaching is pretty messy. But clearly pedagogy is not everything we have to think about. So what's missing? No, it's not multiple choice quizzes. Teaching is always about something, something that we call content. And content can also vary a great deal. Um, everything from geology, biology, physics, astronomy, art, music, chemistry, computers, what have you. And the funny thing is that every discipline is messy too. And how do we know that? Well, look at all these battles that have been raging. In fact, one can almost call them wars that have been raging over things like the canon. No, not that kind of canon, but about the kinds of books that students should be reading, whether it emphasizes Western civilization versus other groups which have been um, marginalized in the past, and so on. Let's think about the math and science wars, and of course, the phonics versus whole language debate. So all these things are up for contention and argument. So we've covered that you know both of these individually are pretty messy, but that's not all. What happens when you combine the two together? This is where Schulman came up with the idea of pedagogical content knowledge, and that's Lee Schulman, who incidentally was at Michigan State um, when he came up with this idea. And the idea here is that content areas in teaching have to be transformed, brought together in interesting kinds of ways to make it accessible to students. So for instance, a mathematician would not necessarily be a great teacher of mathematics. Same goes for a psychologist, artist, or scientist. Quality teaching 
is the transformation of content. It is the act of learning to think in a disciplined manner. And if you're interested, this is a great book um, by Janet Donald called Learning to Think Disciplinary Perspectives. I'd recommend it strongly um, to anybody who's interested in some of these ideas. <clears throat> so Schulman had this great contribution which I think really moved the field forward. And the question comes up as Matt's texting me from here, um, where's the technology? All right, so where's technology? Um, yeah, sure, PowerPoint uh, could be there, but I think we mean much more. Web 2.0, blogs, digital videos, Second Life, Geometer Sketchpad, Wikipedia, SimLife, handheld computers, MP3 players, flytop, pentop computers, which I think is the worst name ever for a product, uh, World of Warcraft, Linux, Blackboard, MapQuest, and the list goes on and on and on. And so for once I think Matt is right that this is expecting too much um, if we think that people can keep up with this um, rapid change. So one of the things we argue is that instead of focusing on keeping up with every piece of technology or software, we argue for something di different. We argue for developing a thoughtful yet playful attitude towards understanding the landscape being created by these new technologies. What one can call this new media ecology that we live in. Now these digital technologies that we are talking about, the funny thing about them is that they are pretty messy too. Okay, um, I'll give the example of the iPhone. If you you know, most of you have seen it. Um, if you look at the iPhone, one of the things is that with software, it's pretty protein, which means that once you move away, one of the biggest restrictions on cell phones was the number of buttons that you had on it. Now, once you move to a complete software screen, if you want to add another function, it's just writing some more code. And that's one thing very powerful that software lets us do. Well, with that comes a problem, which is that it's unstable, okay? Um, asked me at some point about the problems I'm having with Best Buy and my iPod for the last three months. And I'm sure all of us have faced these error um, messages at some point or the other. On top of that, these new technologies are opaque, which means that, you know, there was to be a time when, when you would buy a car, you'd kick the tires, and now you take your car and they reboot the car, because the car is a computer, right? That changes the meaning of booting the tires, right? And, you know, any technology now, it's not obvious from what it does, how it works inside. And that makes it tricky as well. But despite all this, technology changes everything. Ah, yes, um, IT, information technology, changes everything. Um, <clears throat> let's look back at these three components that we have talked about so far. Pedagogy, content, and technology. And let's do the Schulman move. And when I say the Schulman move, what Schulman did is took pedagogy and content and overlap them. What we're going to do is we're going to look at content and technology and pedagogy and technology in turn. So we do the Schulman move on content and technology. Now there are lots and lots of examples that we had actually because of time we didn't include. But we included one, and that is literacy technologies. Somebody once said that the book is a machine to think with. And I want us to think a little bit back to when it was an oral culture and the move to writing. And this is a quote um, from um, a dialogue by Plato where he argued, yeah, I know this is a long quote, so I had to reduce the font size there. So argued that once we move from an oral culture to a writing culture, we're not going to trust people anymore. We're going to trust the book. We're going to go look it up. So anything I say today, you can go look it up. And that's a fundamental change in the way we think about our relationship to information, to each other, and so on. So this is interesting because we think of print and writing as being this great thing, but at some point there is something lost in that transition as well. Now if we look at the next big change when we look at going from writing to print. Um, here I want to quote from Victor Hugo who argued that in um, his book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, that this will destroy that, but this was the book and that was the cathedral. The book will destroy the cathedral. Because a medium that is now shareable by millions of people with print means that nobody's going to go to a certain specific place, place to get wisdom or knowledge, that it is shareable. And if you look at, if you think about post Gutenberg, we had the Reformation, the American and French revolutions, and a large part of it was dependent on the fact that the large masses of people could now get information that they could check on their own. So Hugo speaks to this 
this connection between technology and content when he says, and I'm going to quote just a part of it, the dominant idea of each generation would in future be embodied in new material. Think about that for a second and look at the picture that Matt just sent to me. That a new material, that of the digital computer, changes things. And so we went from clay to papyrus to scrolls to handwritten text, printed and let type, mass produced books, and now we are at the age of the Kindle and the ebook. And of course, we live now in a world of links and hypertext. And so technology not just changes practices, but it also changes society. So technology and content have always been related in very complex ways. I think that's sort of the message to take away from this part. So that ends this example. Moving on, we talk about another Schulman move, which we look at pedagogy and technology. <clears throat> um, I think one of the greatest innovations that uh, uh, in education in our lifetime is this one. Because it allows anybody on the planet with a computer and an internet connection to access vast amounts of information. That is just an amazing, amazing thing. Combine that with this, with possibly the one laptop per child, we are looking at something, a fundamental shift in human cultural evolution. The repercussions of which will be felt, which we won't even realize, I think, for 100 years, and the repercussions will be felt for many, many more. But the example that I want to talk about is much smaller, much more local. Um, we teach an online course using the software called Moodle. I know many of you must know it. Um, and Moodle is an open source online software system. And one of the problems that we face in online learning and online teaching, I'm sure those of you have taught online and most of you must have, know is what we call the I agree phenomenon, which is that once a couple of students have made a few postings, that everybody else just goes on and says, me too. <laughs> okay? And so you, this, you don't get the kind of engaged discussion around topics that you would like. Well, Moodle does one thing that allows us to get over this I agree phenomenon. What Moodle lets you do is in a discussion forum is prevent you from seeing other people's postings till you have posted your own. Think about that for a second. So any student who's going to post on a certain discussion topic that you have raised is for that per practical purpose the first one posting. So the pressure is on them to do a good job. The moment the post, they can see what other people have said. Now, this is an affordance that technology gives us that we may not have been able to do even in a face-to-face -face situation. And that's a really powerful thing. <clears throat> now, there's another thing that people speak of when they speak of online learning. It is that the learning never stops. Well, that's not really true. Because you have, the student has to go and log on to the website in order to get it. So we wondered about that. And we said, okay, what is a technology that students are always, it pretty much always interacting with? And that's Facebook. So this semester, one of our uh, graduate students is here who is working with us on this. And we are teaching a course where we have two sections, one where the discussions are in Moodle, the other where the discussions are going on in Facebook. Now think about what it means from the student point of view. They go to their Facebook site and there's a little message saying, oh, there have been some discussions going on in your this course. Suddenly, the learning process is a part of their everyday life. Now is that a good thing or a bad thing? Whether they like it or not, we are waiting to find out. But there are interesting issues available here. And, so, and we are studying right now how this changes the social and educational discourse just by moving one technology to the other. So back again to our good friends. If this will go, thank you. So one thing that we have argued that each of these is messy, right? But we are still forgetting something. So what did we forget? <laughs> You know, I need to get some way of shutting him up. Uh. <laughs> One thing that we forgot is these three always work within specific contexts. That these contexts matter a great deal. Consider, for instance, the situation of one laptop per child. How does that change how you teach? Or this classroom in India, which has one computer lab where you might get 30 minutes twice a week, you know, with spotty, if any, internet connection, how does that change what you do? 
or the situation in many schools here in the US where students and teachers are restricted from accessing information and websites due to firewalls. We have had that issue come up at MSU right now where some of the technology people are trying to stop the use of Google Docs and you know, stuff like that. Um, and that's a problem, we can see. So, with it, so each institution, each classroom is a context and that becomes critical when we think about this. So a moment to take stock, to sum up, teaching with technology is complex because CPT and messy and let's not forget the overlaps with incomplete and often contradictory information with no stopping rule. And when I say that no stopping rule means we never know as educators when we are done. Did we get every kid, did every kid or every person in my class understand what it is that I want to say? We never really know that. So any solutions that we come up with are typically not right or wrong, but good or bad. We can't make absolute judgments, we can make relative judgments. And they are unique and context dependent. And finally, every solution leads to new problems. So the Facebook example is one where we can do that, then students might rebel against it, or they all go and join. Um, instead of Facebook, they start doing Orkut or something like that, so things change. In short, what we argue is that teaching with technology is wicked. And wicked is a term that we take from Rittle and Weber, and if you want, you can go back and look at it, but the way they define what a wicked problem is, it seems to us that teaching with technology is a classic example of that. So what is the solution to that? One thing we know is that standard approaches don't work. We look for a royal road to teaching or the yellow brick road to teaching, and we know that there is none. So, that brings us back to our refrain. All right, number two. Wicked problems require creative solutions. Well, clearly we live in a new media ecology, one that is characterized by change. <clears throat> and this change, as, this, as Matt just sent me this image, he's very good at Google, you can see. He finds this right away and sends it to me. Um, in, a, in, a, in an environment characterized by change, it becomes critical, it becomes a question almost of survival, of how you survive in this new environment. So we ask this really profound question. This is a really deep question. I think the deepest question we're going to ask today here. What can we learn from a fish? <laughs> I'd like to introduce all of you to a very interesting little fish. This is the Trinidadian guppy. It lives in a range of environments, some stable, some less so. And therefore, it has developed a flexible reproductive strategy. When the times are good and things are going well, there's not much fluctuation in the environment, it produces fewer babies because it can take care of them. But when times are bad, it does something different. It has lots of babies. Because it knows that it cannot support all of them, and so it knows that many of them would die, so that's a really good strategy. And so the question is, so? So, in a world characterized by change, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of good ideas. So in that sense, creativity becomes key to surviving in this new media ecology. All right. But what is creativity? Uh, I know it when I see it. That's one way of thinking about it. Because creativity is often easy to recognize and hard to define. And if you see that quote that Matt has, Justice Potter Stewart, was actually how Justice Stewart defined pornography in the Supreme Court decision. That I know it when I see it. And creativity in some ways is like that. But it seems to us that we ought to do better. So I'm going to share with you some examples of creativity. Example one, it's a fantastic social innovation, um, which I think is going to have a huge educational payoff in the future. And this is Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Prize Prize winner two years ago, and the inventor of the idea of the microcredit. I don't know how many of you know about the microcredit. These are small loans that are given to people in villages, typically $15, $20. The return rate on these investments is much better than loans that typically banks have been giving. And these people use these to set up their own little shop or some kind of a store or something like that. And here's a woman who has received that loan. And you can see the kids behind her. So this is a huge change in the way we think about it, about development in, in the third world. 
interesting thing here is that they found out that it's much smarter to give loans to women than to men. Men tend to drink it up and waste it while women end up supporting the family, which is why I think that a, support, you know, a family that's supported and nurtured, kids go to school. So in some way, this is a huge educational uh, move. It's grown a great deal. It's grown from around 8 million to over 100 million people across many countries in the world today. A good example of a creative solution. Second example, this is a personal one. This is getting my son to be interested in reading. Um, you know, he's a very sporty kind of guy and stuff like that. And so we'd buy him books and we'd buy him software. And he would do that. And don't get me wrong. It's not that he wouldn't do what we asked him to. But he wouldn't go out and seek it out. He didn't want to read. So I gambled $20 a year for the past three years um, by putting him into an NCAA bracket pool run by Matt here. And um, one can argue that, <clears throat> that that's possibly a bad idea. But the result that we are seeing here is that over the past three years, I've seen an increased sophistication and knowledge and understanding of sports, his interest in going and reading the newspaper every day, and he has never made me back any money. I'm hoping this year would be um, the year that I get my repaid on my investment. But what is most interesting is that every morning, he's the first guy out the door getting the newspaper and reading the newspaper. And that's something I think that is invaluable. And that's great, particularly when you're in Michigan and the weather we've been getting, it's him getting out in the snow and getting the newspaper. <laughs> So that's really important. So that's example two. Example three. This is an example I found in a men's room um, somewhere. And this is in Shifal Airport. So I'm you know, laid over there because I'm traveling to India or something. And I go to the men's room and I go to the toilet. And I find there's a bug. And I'm like, ooh, this is not good. So I go to the next one. And I f figure out that, oh, it's not a bug. It's actually a feature. So I took some photographs there, and that's actually, I'll give you a close up, that's actually um, a printed bug. So um, it's a pretty accurately rendered um, printed 3D bug that's printed on the toilet bowl. Turn out, turns out it's a great design feature since uh, men, and I'm not suggesting anything here, um, tend to lead to less spills and a cleaner and um, easier to maintain public restrooms. I've got something to do with that evolutionary past. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to go there. I haven't, I haven't been to the women's room to check it out so to know what's going on there. I think I was in enough trouble, as Matt is suggesting here, post 9-11 with a digital camera in an airport. Uh, but those are the kinds of sacrifices we make for research. All right, so three examples. What's common to all these examples? So here's creativity one, two, three. First, a creative idea is new. It's novel, it's different, it's innovative, it's astonishing, it's surprising, all these kinds of good words. But that's clearly not enough, as this middle fork over there shows that just being unique doesn't mean you're useful. So clearly creativity, when we talk about it, needs to have a component of being effective of being useful, valuable, important, significant, so on and so forth. And look at the three examples that we talked about. Each of those was something novel, but it also was useful. It solved the problem in a different, in a new kind of way. But that's not all. Most definitions of creativity, in fact, if you look up, will stick themselves with these two. But we feel that there is one absolutely integral thing that was missing in most of these definitions, that a creative solution is whole in some way. It's integrated. There's an aesthetic integration, a completeness, a beauty and elegance to a creative solution, which makes it really powerful. And when you think about wicked problems, you cannot break them down into little parts and solve each part. There has to be a holistic component to that, and I think the creative solution captures that. So we say it's not just new, but it's the new new. And what do we mean by that? We mean it needs to be novel, effective, and whole. Novel, effective, and whole. That's a nice little acronym. Ah, Matt sent me a message again. And he says, well, creativity is about this big aha moment. You know, special people are creative, Picassos and the Einsteins of the world. But I think a lot of research shows that he is wrong. <laughs> that really, creativity is nothing but 
variations on a theme. That you take an idea and you tweak it. And you tweak it and you tweak it and then you end up with something very new. Um, let's look at the example of the Rubik Cube. All right? Let's do some, and I've done this in workshops where you have students actually come up with variations. So I'll not do that today for uh, things of time. But here are some superficial variations that one can do. For instance, you can change the stickers from being square to circular. You can make a keychain out of it. You can put jewels on it. Um, you can actually make it for Braille so that blind people can solve it. And my favorite, which is the all red Ruby cube. Um, took me not much time to figure that one out. So um, I felt that was good. But here's another variation that one can make. Why is it three by three by three? So some people made these. Two by two by two, four by four by four, five by five by five, right? Then somebody asked the question, why this repeating three by three by three? Why n by n by n? So they came up with these ones. It's a two by three by two, and so on and variations and so forth. So you can see, and if you go to twistypuzzles.com, you can get over a thousand variations. You know, so I just picked up, uh, we just picked up a few from there. Now, the ruby cube is a cube, which is a platonic solid. So somebody asked the question, hmm, can we make it out of other shapes which are platonic solids? So there we go. You have your dodecahedron and your icosahedrons and your tetrahedrons, all of which have been made into puzzles. Then somebody went and asked the question, why restrict ourselves to three dimensions? And so they made a software hypercube. It's a Rubik's Cube in four dimensions. I do not recommend that you play it. <laughs> you know, um, I tried, it took me, I think, 15 minutes just to figure out how I could make a move. <laughs> um, so I don't really strongly recommend that. But one thing about all these examples, I think all of you would be thinking that these seems like obvious moves in this problem space. You know, you take go from two by two, two, you go to three by three by three. Now I want to share an example with you um, of game designer, puzzle designer Scott Kim, where he looked at one aspect which he calls simultaneous motion, which is that when you twist the Rubik's Cube, certain pieces which are behind come up to the front and pieces that are in the front go you know, back, which means you have to keep thinking what's happening back there. So he said, what would a game look like if I just get the idea of simultaneous motion and remove everything else? And so he came up with this game called Double Maze. And what happens in this that you have to get those two white balls to specific locations within each maze. The problem is, when you make a move on this ball, the other ball moves at the same time. So which means, again, if you look at this game, would you see a connection to a Rubik's Cube? It is a completely different thing, but what he did is that he took one element of that and tweaked that and pushed it to its limit. So in that sense, creativity is nothing but tweaking knobs the idea being that you have the right knobs to tweak. So, you with me, Matt? Oh, okay. So I guess uh, I need to recap here a little bit. So to recap, we live in a new media ecology, okay, where these three things and context are very important and they lead to wicked problems. We know that standard approaches don't work, that there is no royal role to teaching, that creativity is the only solution, and we now know that creativity needs to be, a creative solution is novel, effective, and whole, and we get there not through magic, but through a playful process of tweaking knobs. All right? So the big question then becomes, what are teachers and teacher educators to do? Where do the knobs come from? Which brings us back to the refrain. Teaching with technology is a wicked problem, and that's because CPT and overlaps and context are, lead to a wicked problem. Teachers, uh, wicked problems require creative solutions. We know what creative solutions are novel, effective, and whole, and it's not magic. It's a process that we can go through, and the teachers are designers of the total package. All right. Number three, teachers are designers of the total package. So what do we mean when we say total package? <clears throat> the first thing is that we have these three, technology, pedagogy, and content. They are critical for any kind of teaching endeavor to take place, that they work within specific contexts. We have talked about overlaps taking them two at a time. 
And I want to take us now to the most important overlap, which is all three taken together. It's at the center of these three that what we call TPCK, technological pedagogical content knowledge, exists. And yes, it is a mouthful. So as Glenn suggested, we try to buy a vowel, you know, 50 bucks, and there we have it. And the interesting thing here is that TPAC also becomes an acronym for total package. TPAC, total package. Oh, all right, so I'm sure you get it. <clears throat> now, this is not to say that this is something new that we are saying. Many people have said this, and in fact, good teachers understand this instinctively. So the question then becomes, how does TPAC help? And it seems to us that what TPAC does is that technology opens us new possibilities for us. I want to give some examples quickly here. The first one is one that I already mentioned before, the one with Moodle and the I agree problem. That's a good solution to an I agree problem that we can now see postings only when I have posted my first posting. And we have done this with, a, um, we do an example of uh, students see a magic trick and they have to explain what the trick is, how that's working. And we are looking at whether they come up with sort of cognitive information processing sort of explanations for that. And if we didn't have this, the first person who got it, everybody else would just say, I agree. And here they are forced to think about it and try to solve it. But again, the question we have to ask ourselves every time, is it novel, effective, whole? Is it a total package? And for each of the examples, I'm going to ask us, this question. And maybe that's a question that we need to ask ourselves as educators, as teachers, when we are trying to use technology in a classroom. These are two critical questions. Example number two. Uh, this is a short video uh, of a third grade teacher, and uh, I let her speak for herself. Hello, my name is Cindy Morden, and I'm a third grade teacher at Doherty Elementary School in West Bloomfield, Michigan. My classroom is made up of 24 students that are very diverse, and basically, Children at this age are very stuck on concrete representations of, of everything, basically. And when they're looking at a map, it's really hard for them to grasp the concept of north, south, east, west, and the compass rows, and really having that perspective of direction and following maps are um, sometimes difficult. Okay. So the goal is to understand maps, to go beyond concrete understandings, and to make maps more personal. Um, this is a part of a much longer video, so I'm showing you some little clips from that. And Cindy tried a bunch of different solutions. I mean, she used MapQuest, KitPix, satellite photos as a way, as ways of getting into students' understanding, as a way of getting them to see themselves as located in the space, which is north, south, east, west, coordinates, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, tried virtual field trips. I'll let her speak about uh, one such trip that she took. I actually did this with a trip through Washington, D.C., and we took the video camera on the trolley ride and um, got uh, shots of all the different monuments and traveling on the trolley in the different directions, and the kids were really able to grasp um, the concept of making turns on the map and traveling north, south, east, or west and relating it to the more abstract map. It really drives home the hands-on and personal experience for the child. They really feel a part of this. They, they can make those connections that it's their world and they're working with it. And it's, it's like a discovery experience for them. It's like one of those aha moments of uh, this is where I am on the map. And that really is inspiring for the kids. OK, so you can see in this little example, and we were kind of deliberate not to choose some very high tech new examples because the idea with the TPAC is that it can work even with some very basic technology. So a whiteboard is a technology in the way we think about it. So what this does, you can see, is that offer new opportunities to connect with content. And again, of course, the question that we ask ourselves, is it novel, effective, and whole? Is it the total package? The third example is not really an example, but a possibility that we'd like to um, share with you. We want to introduce you to a bunch of uh, creatures. Um, we had the Trinidadian guppy, and this time we are going to go with some sand creatures. And these are creatures developed by this designer called Theo Jensen. Um, I think he's in South Africa. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it's fascinating. My name is Theo Jensen. I'm a kinetic sculptor. 
My sculptures are made of very light materials and they are powered by the wind. A part of me is an engineer who wants to map the progress of mobility. Another part is an artist who wants to sculpt the air that surrounds us and give it shape. And always I strive to push the boundaries of what we know and what seems possible to us at this moment in time. The walls between art and engineering exist only in our minds. If you haven't seen examples of his work, do go online and look him up. I mean, it is absolutely mind-boggling the kinds of creatures he's created, which move just because of the breeze. And he has these things where if you move close to it, it will move away from you. It's just fascinating. So this is something that you know this guy's doing. He's an artist, engineer, whatever he is. And the question is that what does that mean for a kid in a classroom? And there is a website called sodaplay.com where you can actually go and create these creatures. And I'm going to see if I can get it to show up here. There we go. There's a little soda play guy. And you can't see the full thing because the screen resolution. Let me see if I can. There we go. So you can see you can change the force of gravity. Uh, I can't see my cursor, I'm sorry. But you can change the force of gravity, you can change friction, and you can design this creature. And this is not the only creature you can design. You can design a whole bunch of different creatures that will move and interact with the environment and so on. So here's somebody who's working with actual materials. Here's a simulation. Again, coming back to the protein nature of the computer. It's a question of that it allows, that software allows you to do all kinds of different things. Um, it's interesting if you go in there and you change gravity to negative, this creature starts floating up. Um, this is kind of, kind of fun. To come back, <clears throat> one thing that Theo Janssen said, where he said that the, the walls between art and engineering exist only in our minds. And I want us to think about that a little bit with a slight change. That the walls between technology, pedagogy, and content exist only in our minds. But we have to be willing to play with the knowledge that we have. If you look at current practice about how technology, pedagogy, and content are treated in, in you know, teacher education programs and other places, find that typically they are separated from each other. Or at best, you know, Schulman's work has been around for a while, so people expect that, you know, pedagogy and content need to be covered, but technology is taken as being separate. You know, you have a separate set of courses about technology and so on. And T is sort of sitting out there, separate from everything. And we argue that this is learning to play jazz one note at a time. And there's a, um, the best way it seems to learn to play the piano is you take one note and play it for a month. So you just play the pling, pling, you keep playing that note for a month. The next month you move on to another note. Because, you know, learning to play the piano is becoming intimate with each note. And then after you've done all the notes, you spend a month playing nothing, because music is also about the silences between the notes. And at the end of that six month or eight month, whatever period it is, you should be able to play box goldberg variations. Right? Sounds good, but doesn't work. And I think that what we need to do is apart from, go move away from this one note at a time and move on something as opposed to some, you know, that where these three are integrated, interdisciplinary, allowing for creative play with both content pedagogy and technology. I mean, not both, all three, sorry. Um, this is a quote from Glenn Gold, keeping with the music theme, where he argued, and this is again coming back to the idea of technology, digital technology in particular being protein, that implicit in electronic culture is the idea of multi-level participation in the creative process. And I think that becomes sort of a critical part, a way of thinking about it. So we thought we would um, engage in some play here. So here's a game that we called T-Pack Mashup. Ah, uh, yeah, I, well, I, sure, it's not going to sell a lot, but that's okay. And, but the game um, is to help us identify some nodes. And we actually did this at the NTLS Summit um, back in summer that Glenn just mentioned. And the way that works is pick any two out of those figure out how to integrate the third. For instance, start with C and T. So you could go with third grade language arts, grade six mathematics, undergraduate cultural studies, what have you. Choose some technology at random, a microscope, a wiki, Photoshop, and see 
how you could integrate them. So could you go with grade three language arts and Photoshop, or cultural studies and the microscope, right? What pedagogical strategies would you use? What would you do? And you'll see guys quickly enough that this is a pretty wicked problem. That the solutions that you come up with need to be created, not just creative in the new, that something brand new or shocking came up, but in our new definition of new, that it's novel, effective, and whole. And of course, you could start with um, any of the other two. And what this game does is that you start seeing knobs that you didn't see before. And that's a really powerful thing to do. You start seeing possibilities and potentials that you could now take with your content, with your technology, and you know your pedagogical style, whatever it may be, that you can mix and match with this. So this is in keeping with this idea of the mashup, which is of course the new big thing, right? Okay, um, <clears throat> we are coming to the close of our talk here. I'm seeing it's 41 minutes, so I don't want to keep you guys up much longer. So it brings us to our refrain as always. The teaching with technology is a wicked problem. Wicked problems require creative solutions. Teachers are designers of the total package. Closes the refrain. If you remember, we started with an intro, and uh, so in parallel to the intro, we need to have the outro. Um, this is something uh, Matt's a big guitar hero freak, so he taught me this term. So I want to start with a question. And the question is, where do educators live? Where do you live? Where do I live? Where do we live? Do we live in this box? Okay. Or, uh, as I would argue, or we would argue, we live bang there in the middle. Be it Blackboard or Blackboard.com. This is where educators live. This is where you live. This is where I live. This is where we live. At this intersection between something that we want to convey to others, that's the content, the style, the technique that we would use to convey it, and the technologies and techniques that we have for doing so. It's at the intersection of these that we live. That's where we always have lived and always will. There. Quality teaching always understood the essential tension which leads to new ideas, novel, effective, and whole. And so to end, let's play. Our future depends on it. Our children's future depends on it. That's our outro. <coughs> Um, we'd like to thank a couple of people here um, who have been, without whom none of this DPAC stuff I think would have um, taken off, um, who very early on, we didn't even know about them at that time, um, so read the papers and stuff and pushed the ideas and the agenda. And we'd like to thank Ann Thompson, uh, Judy Harris, Glenn Bull, Joe Gilbert at AACTE and all the authors of the handbook. Um, at site, Ian Gibson, Gerald Knizek, once again, thanks for the um, shirts and Gary Marks, uh, who makes all this thing happen very smoothly. Though till yesterday we didn't even believe that he existed, honestly. Uh, <laughs> uh, and before we go, um, you know, we have a shameless plug. <laughs> the handbook of TPCK is out. We don't make any money off it, but you know, go buy the book anyway. Um, <laughs> and uh, there is an open forum with the authors today at 11 o'clock, uh, details in your schedule and there's the TPAG SIG meeting at 1.15. Uh, we'd love to see you guys there. And we have another shameless plug. We are looking for some wonderful, good graduate students who want to do the PhD, uh, join the PhD program at Michigan State. So, you know, we have a signing bonus, which I think is against all NCAA rules, but, you know. Uh, we, we call it a scholarship. I think that's fair, right? That's okay. Okay. Um, so that's it. Um, this tpck.org, if you haven't visited it, it's a wiki which we are looking for contributions from people, so do visit that. Um, those are our websites. And finally, would like to thank three people whom uh, we have never met, who, led, who inspired us to try something different um, in this presentation. It's Stephen Colbert with this idea of you know, the word, left and right. Um, Larry Lessig and Dick Hart, whose presentation styles we have copied indiscriminately. 
Um, you know, it's like copying the HTML tags from a web page, so we'd like to thank them as well. Thank you very much.